If you will, turn with me this morning to Acts chapter 16. I'm going to start reading in verse number uh, 22. This um, has to do with a very famous passage of Scripture, uh, the Philippian jailer and the reason that he got saved. Verse number 22 And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. A couple of things about that. First of all, uh, Paul and Silas were preaching the gospel, and for the gospel's sake, they were beaten and arrested. Another thing that we see there is that uh, the magistrate charged the jailer to keep them safely in the Roman culture and they had not been charged as yet and the jailer didn't know exactly what that they were going to be charged with but in the Roman law legal system if the jailer allowed the prisoners to escape then he had to serve their sentence and so it was very important to the jailer at this particular stage in, in this passage of scripture that, uh, that the jailer uh, understood no matter what was going to happen to Paul and Silas, if he let them go or if they got free, that he would serve their sentence. And so it goes on there in verse, uh, verse number 24, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stock. So he took extra precautions. Not only did he put them in the innermost prison, but he also put their feet in the stocks and, uh, and make sure that they didn't get away. Now their response to the situation they were in, first of all, they were right in the exact same place that God wanted them to be, and they were doing exactly what God wanted them to do. And yet they got into this particular predicament. And verse 25 says, At midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So they, were, they didn't do it quietly. They, they, they sang and they prayed and they, they let everybody know that they were trusting in God. And in the midst of all of their complicated predicament they were on they wanted God's will to be done in their life in verse 26 it says and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed God works in mysterious ways and he did so here and the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prisoners doors the prison doors open. He drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. What I'm speaking to you about this morning is what is a believer? Are we believers because we come to church? Are we believers because we sing the gospel songs and read the Bible? A lot of folks do that that are not believers in God. What is a believer? Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for your blessings today. The blessing of revealing to our hearts the intentions of this passage of Scripture. And I pray, Father, that you would not only help us to see what your purpose is, but also, Lord, that when we leave this place we might follow that purpose with our lives and that we might truly be believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask today for you to visit with us here, Lord. Touch our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What is a believer? What uh, must a person do to be saved? Same type question, same idea. Jesus divides the world into two different groups in John chapter 3 and verse 36. He says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son 
shall not see life. But that's the result of not believing. The wrath of God abideth on him. So God says that there are two groups of people in the world. There are those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him for their salvation. And then there are those who have not. And those that have not, the wrath of God abideth on them. John 3, 18 does the same thing. It says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It makes a difference what you believe in. It makes a difference what you do with your life. As a matter of fact, the Bible has 153 verses that make believing the determining factor of salvation. The Bible teaches saving faith, but never teaches saving before believing. Belief is an attitude of the soul through which Jesus saves. Not merely actions or motions that we might go through, but an attitude of our heart. Jesus is the object of faith taught in the Bible. Believe on him. Faith in the wrong object can result in a trip to hell. It's important that we understand who Jesus is. Jesus is not only the Son of God, but He's God the Son. The creator of all things that were created. We need to have faith in Him. And that's what that, there's two ways of putting this in, in Scripture. It says to believe on Him or to believe in Him. Somebody told me one time a, a difference between believing in something and believing on something. And they said that there was a, a man who wanted to walk a tightrope across uh, the Niagara Falls. And he stretched the line across and uh, he uh, got on it and he walked out several hundred feet and walked back. And when he came back, he got a wheelbarrow and he put the wheelbarrow on the, 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 the stretched out line that went across and he walked all the way across with the wheelbarrow in front of him and then he turned around on the other side and walked all the way back to where the crowd was. And everybody just cheered and they said, man, this, is a, this guy, can, he's the most wonderful type of, uh, type of artist that I've ever seen. And he said, now, he said, you believe I'm the greatest? And they all said, yes, we do. And he says, well, how many of you would like to get in the wheelbarrow and go across with me? You see, they believed in him, but they were very reluctant in believing on him by getting in the wheelbarrow. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is, is rejecting all other thoughts of, of uh, salvation, all other ideals of good works or, or doing things that will impress God. You see, we, we as human beings, we want to have control of everything, and that includes salvation. We want to say, well, I'm saved because of what I am or who I am or how good I've been. But that's not what the Bible tells us. Faith in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Not just looking at Jesus. I mean, there's crosses everywhere. Jewelry stores have crosses in them. You see them going down the highway, but making that faith in Jesus count by getting in the wheelbarrow, if you will. Not just looking at Jesus, but looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus because of the debt that we owe. You know, you say, well, what debt is that? What could I possibly owe? Well, you've, you've heard the, the, the Bible account of Adam and Eve and how that um, Eve was deceived, but Adam went into the whole thing with his eyes wide open. He didn't want to be separated from Eve, and so he therefore ate of the fruit as well. 
Well, you see what happened there was that he sold this creation into bondage by not following what God said. He said, don't eat of this certain tree in the, in the forest. And because of his sin, that sin was passed on down through the line of man. And the Bible says in wages 623, the, and the Bible says in Romans chapter 623, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, sin is really a, a debt that we owe. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Now, that's not talking about a natural death because unless the Lord comes back and takes us home, we're all going to, to die. That's a bodily death, but it's talking about an eternal death. It's talking about a death that will last forever in a place called hell. It is a debt, quite frankly, we can't afford to pay. Eternal death as opposed to eternal life. Jesus says, look unto me. We're to go to him for the payment. You say, well, how is that possible that Jesus could, could take the sin debt and pay that debt? That's what the cross was all about. And it wasn't something that was just brand new and just thought up there in, in the, the years of his ministry. The sin debt was always pictured in the death of the animals in the blood sacrifice. But in the Old Testament, the sins were rolled back because the perfect blood had not been shed yet. In the New Testament, our slate is wiped clean because the blood of Jesus was shed on the cross of Calvary for us. Isaiah wrote about this many years before Jesus was even born. It says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. So the sin debt is paid through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Oh, but does that mean everybody that believes that Jesus died on the cross is saved? No. It means those that look unto Jesus, that come to him, that seek him by believing in him. Looking to the Lord, John 19.30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. There's lots of debates that are going on around spiritual areas and church areas and uh, even in uh, philosophical areas about the death of Jesus Christ. And some say that the Jews killed him and some say that the Romans killed him. But the truth of the matter is you can't kill God. The Bible explains it quite clearly. He gave up the ghost. He said it is finished. When it was finished, he finished it. He gave up the ghost. Death is a requirement to pay that debt of sin. That's the reason why that in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve were hiding in the, the, the bushes and they had gotten leaves and they had covered up their nakedness with the leaves. You see, prior to the sin, they didn't know about nakedness. They didn't know about sin, but afterwards they did because the sin debt had been passed on to them. And God killed some innocent animals there and made coats of skin to cover up their nakedness. That was the first blood that was shed for sin. Death is a requirement to pay the sin debt. Jesus purchased eternal life for all of us who will believe in him. Purchased a place in heaven for us. 
Now, the, it also, we look at this idea of looking unto Jesus. It's not looking unto ourselves. It's not looking into a great teacher. It's not looking even into an organization such as a church or something like that. There are many people who say, well, all of the, all, the church is the only one that has permission to say, well, you know, that's not true. Jesus Christ is the one who holds that in the palm of his hand. He's the one that is the Savior. It's not an organization, but it's a person. And it's not of works. And I, I can't put it any plainer than this. Some of the first verses that I learned to memorize were Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now let me say this to you. If you can earn your salvation, then it is not the free gift of God, and therefore you don't have it. You have to earn it. You have to earn it. How long do you think that you would have to work to buy a spot in heaven? I mean, we talk about all of the things that have happened recently about the fires in California, and they said that there was over $2 billion worth of homes that were burned and, and, uh, and, and the, the cost of putting those homes back in place. And, and, but how long, how, much, how long do you think you'd have to work to buy a spot in heaven. Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 18 says the building of the wall, it, is, it was of jasper and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. I had read that verse for a long time, didn't think too much about it until I was, uh, I was in Germany when we uh, sent men to the moon and uh, we, uh, we had a TV hooked up and we all got to watch as they took that first step even in Germany we could pick that up and so we watched it on television and I had remembered when I was a, a child that I had read that it says that uh, the city was pure gold like unto clear glass and as I was watching them they were talking about the helmets that the, these men who were walking on the moon <clears throat> were wearing. And they talked about it, how that when they closed those visors, all you could see was a reflection. You couldn't see the men's faces. But they could see out. And then one of those men from NASA made this astounding statement. They said, yes, that visor plate is coated with pure gold. That's why it shines and gives a reflection. It is pure gold. You can see the reflection in it and they can see through it but it's the purest of gold to keep out the ultraviolet lights that are out there in space. When he said that I went to my room and I got my Bible and I looked this verse up. And I said one more time, God is right. Let the whole world be wrong, but God is right in everything that he does and everything that he says. Well, how good do you think it, you would have to be to earn your way to heaven. Now, first of all, the cost of a spot in heaven, you can't buy it. There's no way. It's by grace, folks. It's by the unmerited favor of God. That's the only way you're going to get to heaven, not by what you can do or what you have done or what you haven't done. Salvation is through the grace of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So if you can't buy your way in, maybe you could earn it in a different way. What, uh, what do you think that you would have to do? Or how good do you think that you'd have to be to earn a place in heaven? Well, Isaiah the prophet, in chapter 64, he makes it quite clear that we're pretty bad people. 
that in, even on our best day, there's nothing good in us. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Now, I got to looking at that word filthy rags one time, and I got out my Hebrew language lexicon, and I began to look up the words there. And in the Hebrew language, there is a word that is translated filthy rags, but it's a one Hebrew word that was a name that was given to the wrappings of lepers when they went out in public they had to wrap themselves up and I don't know if you know very much about leprosy but leprosy is kind of a terrible disease that rots the flesh away and wherever they would wrap themselves when they pull the wrappings off it would pull away the rotted flesh with it and it was a special word that they used for filthy rags and that's that word right there Think how disgusting that is. But we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as those filthy rags. The best we can do is nothing more than filthy rags in the eyes of God because He's perfect and we're not. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So you can't buy your way into heaven. You can't earn your way into heaven. You can't earn your way into heaven by baptism. You know, you, uh, a lot of folks think they, could, they can do certain good works and they can somehow enhance their salvation. And this, this, you're, you're, you're saved unto good works. There's no doubt about that. But you're not kept saved by your good works. They are just a demonstration of what lives within you, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And some folks have said, well, you know, if you baptized. That will put you into heaven. And that's not true at all. Baptism is like a wedding band that's worn on a finger it's an outward symbol of an inward decision. It's almost as if, and I remember when, when I first got married, I had my wedding ring and I was showing it to the guys where I worked. And the bad thing about that, I worked in a machine shop and uh, whenever I would um, wash my hands after working in the machine shop, I would take my ring off and I would place it up on a, a little shelf and wash my hands, and then I would take my ring, and I would say, look at that, that's, a, that's my wedding ring. And I was just as proud of that wedding ring as I could possibly be, and then one day I got home, and I had left the ring on the shelf, and I never did find it again. My wife forgave me. We bought another ring. And I realized, you know, that is not a symbol that is not our love on my finger. That is a symbol of our love. Baptism is not salvation. Baptism is a symbol that you have been saved. And you are bragging when you get baptized. You're bragging and telling people, I did what God told me to do. See? My wedding ring. My baptism. I'm proud of what I did. But you can't earn salvation by baptism. If a person is not married in their heart, all the gold rings in the world will not matter to them. Baptism comes after salvation. The wedding band comes after the wedding. Don't get the cart before the horse. You can't earn it by joining a church. Some people say the church has all the authority. The church has some authority. For instance, if somebody got saved today and we were trying, we were going to baptize them, 
I would have to go before the church to get permission. That's something that I've not ever done here. The authority to baptize is within the local church. I would have to get your permission to baptize someone today. It's not by joining the church. It, the, the verse doesn't say by looking unto the church for eternal life. It says looking unto Jesus. John 14, 6 Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Very exclusive club, Christians. We're not all going to heaven by different ways. There's only one way to heaven, and Jesus is that way. That's how we're saved. Now, is there going to be a change in your life after you get saved? There certainly is. And I say that with all certainty. Because everybody that I've ever known that was truly saved, there was a change in their life. I was, uh, we got this um, CD. We went over to Snyder and picked it up. I don't know. How many of you know who Johnny and Nelda Flanagan are? Okay, some of you know. Uh, well, Johnny Flanagan has a way of taking songs and turning them into a gospel message. And uh, he's, he's put out quite a few uh, CDs and tapes and things like that. And so we went over to get this CD to take. My wife was going to take it to Japan. Uh, Brother Ken Board over there uh, has never heard Johnny and Nelda Flanagan sing. And so she wanted him, them to have some of their songs. And so on the way back from Snyder, we were playing the song in, uh, on, our, on our disc player in the car. <clears throat> and I remember as we were going down the road and I thought, man, this is perfect. He was singing this song and, he, and, and he, he's, the, the title of the song and the, the meaning of the song was, if you is what you was, then you ain't. It's talking about salvation in his song and that's, basically that's what the gist of it is. If you is what you was, then you're not. Because when you get saved, there's going to be a change. You're going to look at the world in a whole new way. And the world is going to look at you in a whole new way. Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, Master, we've heard that uh, you can do all of these miracles and you can do all these things and... and uh, we, we, we want to find out about this. And, and uh, Jesus started right out from the very get-go and he looked at Nicodemus and he said, now Nicodemus was not an uneducated man. He was a ruler of the Jews, which meant he knew his Bible, the Old Testament, back, backwards and forwards. But Jesus looked at him and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There's an awful lot of talk about being born again. That's born by the Spirit of God into the family of God. That comes from a deep conviction that Jesus Christ is the only way and you can't get there without Him. Nicodemus is looking at this from an earthly perspective and he looks at Jesus and he says, how in the world can this be? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus kind of defines this, sets it out for him so that there's no way that he'll misunderstand it. He says there's two things that people have to be. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, we're born of water when we're born of a natural birth into this world. That's what it's talking about here because he, he defines it a little bit further down here in the next verse. But he says, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. First of all, there's got to be an earthly birth and then there's got to be a spiritual birth for that person to go to heaven. 
And then he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's saying there was a fleshly birth, and then there's a spiritual birth. You're being born again. There's a difference. And if you is what you was, then you ain't. Because a spiritual birth changes people. My wife is getting on a plane uh, tomorrow morning. And she's, uh, her and Grace are going to fly. I asked Grace today, I said, are you going to have to flap your wings so you can fly, Grace? And she said, no. In order to be saved, you have to do your part and let God do His. Your part is looking unto Jesus. If you've ever flown on an airplane, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you understand how all that weight can be lifted off the runway into the air? It's the law of aerodynamics, and that law is that if a plane goes fast enough and enough lift is from the, the air comes underneath it, it actually makes that plane weightless and allows lift to come about. A lot of folks have flown on planes that don't know anything about the law of aerodynamics. Do you have to flap your arms? No, you don't have to flap your arms to stay up. Well, let me say this. When you flew, did you feel funny? Did you laugh? Did you cry? Well, kind of like flying, salvation is not a feeling. In fact, it is a fact of God's law of grace. It doesn't matter really how you feel. Now, you ought to feel something, but I'm, I'm saying to you, some people shout, some people scream and holler, some people cry, some people get so excited they just go into a tizzy when they get saved, and some people don't do anything. But that's... The way you act is not the evidence. The evidence comes after you're saved, and that is in the changed life. And salvation is a fact of God's grace. And by the way, if you could get to heaven any other way than by believing in the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross of Calvary, then why did he have to go to the cross? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. A lot of folks say, Well, you want me to be saved. You, you, you're condemning me as a sinner. Well, let me tell you something. You're already condemned. You're a sinner. And sin will not enter into heaven. And so it is by the grace of God that Jesus Christ went to the cross and took your punishment and my punishment so we could go to that heavenly place. God's done all the work. The only part that's missing is your part, which is looking unto Jesus. Have you done that? Oh my God, I realize I can't get there without you. I realize I can't buy my way in. I can't work my way in. I can't lie my way in. I need the blood of Jesus Christ. give you these facts and then we'll close Jesus died to save all who would come to him but our part is that we must accept his sacrifice and trust him only for salvation believing on him yes I believe
Luke wrote it really well in the book of Acts in chapter 4 and verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no activity, there's no action, there's no charge, there's no price you can pay, there's no goodness that you can do, there's nothing in the whole wide world that you can do for your salvation except to come to Jesus Christ and say, Yes, Lord, I believe on you for my salvation. And if you haven't come to that place in your life, you can this morning. It takes a short walk, a prayer to be said. Listen, it's not it's not what I say. It's thus saith the Lord. If you were to come down here this morning, I would take this Bible and I would show you what the Bible says about salvation and what your need is. And I would ask you to pray to Jesus Christ, not to me, but to Jesus Christ and ask him to save you. Because that's what salvation is all about. Trusting in Him, not in me.